Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. I am Dr. Dawson, and today we are talking about a cat disease. So we went through and talked about all of the dog vaccines and what's in the canine distemper combo vaccine. And now we're going to start going through the feline distemper combo vaccine. So I brought Lizzie here. She's, you know, being a typical cat and not being that excited about stumbling because it's not on her terms. But uh, I brought her down and at least she can say hi. So today we're going to talk about the feline distemper vaccine and specifically we're going to talk about one of the diseases that is in it and that disease is feline panleukopenia. Feline panleukopenia is a very long word so let's kind of break it down into a couple manageable chunks that we can better understand and talk about. So feline, so it infects felines, shocker. Uh, panleukopenia. So we're going to break that down into three different parts. Pan basically and essentially means many. So we're talking about many. And in the case of medicine, leuco stands for white blood cells. So leuco means white in Latin, and we use it to indicate white blood cells specifically, although not always, but usually. Penia. So the last piece of this puzzle is the little phrase penia. Now penia basically means a lack of a decrease of a few of something along those lines. So when we kind of piece it all together, this is a fancy Latin term that basically means you're lacking white blood cells. So panleukopenia is kind of the broad or is the disease name of this virus and is actually describes what we tend to see when this disease goes through in cats. Now, feline panleukopenia is also sometimes known as feline distemper. Uh, and I'll kind of, as we go through and talk about its symptoms, maybe that'll make a little bit more sense. But don't get it confused with canine distemper because they're not at all the same thing. And if you wanna learn about canine distemper, uh, specifically the virus, you can take a look at this video up here. Uh, that if I don't forget to put it there is is there anyway. This disease actually is a lot more like canine parvovirus. Uh, parvoviridae is the family of viruses that include the parvoviruses. Uh, specifically canine parvovirus is one of them and feline parvovirus is one of them. And it also includes some other viruses in pigs and in other species as well. If you wanna go find out about canine parvovirus, you can take a look at this video up here. And the big thing to know about it is that it causes primarily GI symptoms and it likes to kill rapidly reproducing cells. So GI tract, white and red blood cells, and other places in the body where cells are rapidly reproducing. And the same goes for the feline parvovirus, uh, or in this case, feline panleukopenia. It loves rapidly reproducing cells. Now, those cells tend to be a little bit variable, but we can kind of break them down into a few sections. It will affect the GI tract, just like the canine parvovirus. It also often will like to affect the white blood cells. And in cats, unlike the dog virus, uh, in cats, this tends to be one of the most common things that we see, is a decrease in our white blood cell count when we go and do a complete blood count, do all of that blood work, that tends to be what we see. They also, a lot of times, will get complete breakdown of their GI tract just like in dog. It also will often affect the kittens in a way that it doesn't in dogs, uh, or at least not as much. And part of this is because it is so prevalent in the cat populations. We consider this virus ubiquitous, meaning that it is everywhere in the environment. And one of the challenges with this virus is actually killing it. So once it's in the environment, and we'll talk about how it spread in a minute, but it can be in the environment for up to a year. Um, and most of our disinfectants are not going to effectively kill this virus, uh, unlike some of the other viruses like canine hepatitis um, or influenza or coronaviruses, things like that. This virus is extremely hardy and can stay in the environment for quite a long time. 
So we assume that all wild cat populations, feral cat populations, outdoor cats have been exposed to this virus. So when a queen is infected with this virus, not only does it attack the rapidly reproducing cells of their body, so the white blood cells, the GI tract, but it will also attack and kill the rapidly reproducing cells of the kittens. And it, this is a very unfortunate thing, and we'll see some variable symptoms depending on where they are in pregnancy. Sometimes they will resorb the kittens, meaning that if it's really early, the cells kind of just die and the uterus kind of takes care of it and absorbs that tissue and gets rid of it. Sometimes we will see abortion. So they'll have their kittens really early and cats, unlike some other species, do not do well until right before they give birth. If they give birth any more than about 20, maybe even less hours before they would normally and naturally come in, the kittens will die because their lungs don't develop until the very last second. We also will sometimes see some stillborns. So they're born at the normal time, but the kittens are dead. Uh, and occasionally a weird thing called mummification, which I'm not gonna go into in this video, but it happens in pigs as well. It's a really kind of a weird thing, but we're not gonna talk too much about that. The other thing that can happen is it can affect the kittens to where they live and they're born alive, but they develop what's called cerebellar hypoplasia. Now the cerebellum is the back part of the brain and I'll point an arrow to it right now. And the cerebellum is basically used by the body to modulate or smooth out the signals that are coming from the cerebrum. So the cerebrum is the main processing part of the brain. So it processes all of your senses, it processes all of the motor movement, it processes knowing where your limbs are. But a lot of these motor signals go through the cerebellum. The cerebellum will basically smooth out all of the motions that the cerebrum is putting forth. So I will show a very short video here of where a cat has cerebellar hypoplasia. Basically, the cells are killed by this parvovirus and they develop and their cerebellum is very small and underdeveloped and this will affect them for the duration of their life. It can also sometimes affect the retinal cells, so the cells in the back of the eye that process all of the light and it can affect and kill these and so some cats will be born with limited vision or blindness. So as you can imagine, this virus is not a very fun virus to deal with, and it can cause some very, very severe disease in adult cats, will kill most kittens. So most kittens under eight weeks of age are going to die even with proper and appropriate care. Um, adult cats have a little bit better chance if appropriate care is initiated um, early enough, but Still, without treatment, many of these cats that are infected will die. Not all, but many. This virus tends to be spread through nasal secretions and feces, and sometimes even urine. And as you can imagine with cats, uh, especially feral populations, these they don't have a lot of, um, oh, I only go potty in one place, like we have trained them to do in domestic cases in the house. Uh, and they will leave their feces, they will leave their urine in many different places across the environment. And so this disease spreads extremely easily within a feral cat pop. So we have a cat come in with some variable symptoms and a lot of times this can be difficult to for sure diagnose without a specific test to test for the virus. So mature cats are much less likely to develop the severe clinical signs that we see in younger cats. Uh, but the only way to fully and truly diagnose if a cat has feline panleukopenia is through a blood test that says one, their white blood cells are low and then they test positive on an ELISA. Treatment is often successful in older cats 
when it's properly performed, basically, we're trying to just like in canine parvovirus, supplement and support them. There are no specific antiviral therapies that are used to treat the feline panleukopenia, but supportive care often is enough to get the cats through and help them to survive. So prevention of this disease is extremely important. Uh, we've already kind of established how severe this disease is, how many cats it can kill, how severely this will affect kittens and uh, even kittens in utero where it, they're going to be much more severely affected. So vaccination is extremely important and it's also extremely effective. Any cats that have gone through the vaccine series and continue to get the vaccine on a yearly or every three year basis have a very low risk of developing this disease. In the slight chance that they do develop this disease with a high enough exposure, remember any vaccine can be beaten with a high enough exposure or a weak enough immune system. Uh, so even though they've had the vaccine, it's not necessarily going to prevent 100% of the time. But even if they do get this disease, the side effect, the symptoms and the severity of the disease are gonna be a lot less and a lot and more significantly lowered. Thank you guys so much for watching, and if you haven't already, make sure you like and subscribe. It will really help me to continue producing this type of content, talking about vaccines, talking about diseases, talking about the veterinary world in general, and giving you guys an opportunity to see into the life of a veterinarian. And also, while you're at it, hopefully be a little more educated on your pets. So if you haven't already, like and subscribe um, if you don't mind, and we will see you guys in the next video where we are going to be talking about feline Khaleesi virus, which is another one of the viruses in the feline distemper vaccine.